Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird. Each month on the podcast, we bring you news and insights from the American Translators Association. We look at what's happening at ATA, explore the benefits of membership, and discuss the translation and interpreting professions. You know, the T&I industry is changing rapidly. We hope this podcast will help you keep up with it. ATA was founded over 60 years ago to advance the translation and interpreting professions and foster the professional development of individual translators and interpreters. We have nearly 10,000 members in some 100 countries. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information for you at the end of the show. you also find links in the notes. All right, let's start off with a few quick announcements. Hey, ATA members. Membership renewal time is coming soon. So watch your inboxes for notifications and be sure to renew before the end of the year. If you're not a member, but work in the translation or interpreting fields, now is a great time to discover how ATA membership could work for you. Visit atanet.org to learn about all the benefits. Also, did you attend ATA 63 in Los Angeles? Remember to fill out the overall and session surveys by December 6th for your chance to win a free registration to ATA 64 in Miami and free ATA webinars. Over the years, your feedback has helped shape ATA's annual conference. So please take a moment to complete the surveys and let us know what you think. Finally, the holidays are right around the corner and I bet you're looking forward to some well-deserved time off. But guess what? Scammers don't take time off for the holidays. Technology has given scammers an unprecedented level of sophistication and access, making it easier than ever to be fooled. Don't fall for it. Check out the article in the November 1st ATA News Briefs or watch ATA's on-demand webinar on the subject to learn how you can identify scammers and protect yourself. For information about these announcements and more, look for links in today's show notes. All right, we're back. Joining me today is Madalena Sanchez Sampaolo. Madalena serves as president of the American Translators Association. She's the owner of Accessible Translation Solutions and she's a Spanish to English and ATA certified Portuguese to English translator. Madeleine has served as chair of ATA's Governance and Communications Committee, the Membership Committee, and the Public Relations Committee, and she was also the administrator of ATA's Medical Division. She is also a consultant for the University of Louisville Graduate Certificate in Translation. Madeleine, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Matt. How's everything going? Everything's going well, still dealing with a little bit of <laughs> jet lag from uh, the uh, annual conference in last uh, in Los Angeles, speaking of yeah. which was was only uh, uh, one week away or one week, a little over a week ago. So thank you very much for joining me uh, right after that. Have you recovered yet? Uh, well, I don't have jet lag because it was local to me this year, but I definitely feel like it's it's been a long recovery. So I finally feel caught up on email, um, and I've noticed that other people are feeling caught up too because my inbox is starting to get, um, you know, full again. So I think that definitely it's it, there was a recovery period in there, and I think the conference was just so energizing that it, it didn't feel as uh, difficult to come back after this one. It actually was sad to leave, so I know that we're all looking forward to next year already. I agree. I agree. Of course, the nine hours uh, isn't uh, difficult to deal with, but uh, I did come away this year energized. It was uh, a really great mm-hmm. show. And thank you again and to Veronica for uh, putting that all together this year. Yeah, I think, you know, we really had a good uh, organizational team this year. Veronica did a wonderful job and our staff, especially Adrian Alekna, uh, really put on a great party for us this year. So my role now um, as president is really just a supportive role. Um, I give my input where it's needed, and they really just took this conference and ran with it. And it was, it felt very pre pandemic in many ways with the sessions and the networking events. And I think next year is going to be even better. I agree. It felt, it felt really packed, and it was just nice to see everybody back. Mm-hmm. Now, at the opening session in LA, uh, you said that ATA has made it through a rough couple of years. And of course, our podcast today is on the state of the association. So um, 
I'm wondering if we could talk about uh, some things uh, that you spoke mm -hmm. about at the opening session. You know, one area is membership, uh, which you said has declined. So can you tell us what the current state of membership is and what are the prospects for the near future? Yeah, so definitely our current um, numbers, well, as of the time of the conference, uh, we had eight, we had at the time 8,374 members. We may now have a few more than that, but um, that's the number toward the end of the year that we're looking at. And so uh, for those of us that have been in ATA a while, we peaked back in, I want to say maybe 2011, don't quote me on that year, but it was around that time uh, at about 11,000 members, I think it was. And we stayed steady with around 10,000 for a few years there. And then we've had a decline over the past decade of uh, membership, a slow decline. So, I mean, it was nothing, uh, not a sharp change, but it's been slowly declining over the years. So now we are at just over 8,300 members, but our member retention rate is actually very strong and steady at 83.6%. So in the association world, anything that's over 80% is considered positive, and we've been over 80% consistently for many years. So in, in that way, you know, we're doing quite well. We are retaining members, so members who've been here for, you know, one to three years, they tend to stick around for a while. Um, but our issues are with attracting new members um, from different areas. So We've been working with the membership committee, with the strategy committee, and with a few other groups um, to see where we can reach people who are not yet members of ATA and who would like to be. So um, some of the things that we're talking about are how can we better reach uh, members and chapters and affiliates of ATA who are not yet ATA members um, in some of those local regional groups in the United States. Uh, students is another area where we're really trying to focus a lot of attention to because they will be um, our future translators and interpreters, and we want to be here to support them. So we're we're sort of looking at this uh, in a big picture view in the sense of what are we offering our members and why are they staying and what are what are we drawing new members with and how do we get them to see the value in ATA through things like our, our professional development program, our advocacy program, and so on. Great. Now, I want to talk about a few of the things you just mentioned um, in mm -hmm. a little bit, but... Right now, I'd like to turn to finances. Uh, the past couple of mm -hmm. years um, have been a bit rough on ATA's finances, I understand. And again, at the conference, yeah. uh, you said that financially the ATA could be stronger. Could you please elaborate on that for our listeners? Yeah. So, I mean, financially, we want to always be, you know, financially strong, right, as an association. And we have gone through different periods over the years and even during the time that I've been on the board where we've had... Um, you know, periods where we've been in the red, periods where we've been in the black. And so we've done, you know, well over the years. And we've had a few years where we've had some losses. And right now we are in a period where we're trying to make up for a loss that we had over the past year due to um, expenses mostly related to the hybrid conference we put on in Minneapolis. So um, for those that remember that conference who either attended or heard about um, how we did it, uh, we streamed live and recorded all 160 sessions plus the AST sessions. And as you can imagine, um, we knew that that was going to be a large cost um, to the budget, but we also felt like as a board at the time that that was the right thing to do in a year when there was so much uncertainty, we weren't really sure how many people were going to be able to make it in person. And the board felt at the time that that was the right decision. And I agree that that was the right decision at the time. Um, so we ended up having around 400 or so in-person attendees uh, last year and just, I think, over 800 online attendees, virtual attendees. And so that did not make up for the huge cost of the um, audiovisual, we call AV, um, cost related to streaming and recording uh, a live conference with so many sessions. So that's part of the reason that this year we did not do a hybrid conference. And you're going to probably see a lot of associations who've tried the hybrid model who say, you know, probably it's best to stick to one one or the other. And so um, that's what we found, it, you know, for financial reasons, that's really the way to go. And uh, between that and the fact that we have fewer members than what we'd like to have, a fewer, we've had fewer conference attendees as well in, um, that we, than we'd like to have in the past few years, 
uh, the ATA board and the Finance and Audit Committee are working very closely together to make sure that we do things in a sustainable way moving forward, knowing that these numbers have gone down over the past few years. Of course, looking to try to build those numbers back up, but facing the reality that it's very expensive to put on an in-person conference or even a you know virtual conference for that matter. And so how can we do that well, reduce expenses where possible, and try to balance out um, you know, the different costs associated with these things and make sure that the association does not keep absorbing losses on a regular basis. We want those um, losses to happen on an irregular basis uh, and we can't do that um, unless we plan for these things. So we need to keep trying to provide the same level of services. If membership numbers continue to decline, how do we do that? Those are the things we're talking about. Um, also, the annual conference needs to consistently at least break even in order for ATA to have a strong balance sheet. So um, I know that people who attended the conference heard more about this from our treasurer, John Milan, uh, but that's that's the long and short of it right there. That's it in a nutshell. Right on. Thank you for that. And, you know, speaking of, of COVID, I mean, it made it certainly made the board's life difficult and ATA uh, staff difficult putting on hybrid yeah. and virtual conferences. And it's also made, I'm sure, the job of attracting uh, new members not any easier simply because you don't have those one-on-one, mm -hmm. uh, -on -one, those personal interactions. Um, but yeah. you mentioned you mentioned the retention rate uh, a few minutes ago. And mm -hmm. I know personally from my own interactions with ATA staff and volunteers that there's a lot of hard work going on behind the scenes to reverse the current trend um, in membership. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's safe to say that those efforts in recent years have likely contributed to keeping our retention rate high in these difficult times. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I do agree with that very much. So honestly, Matt, we're offering more than we've ever offered in ATA, um, more programs, more benefits. And, you know, as long as people are taking advantage of those benefits, uh, the membership pays for itself. But it's it's you have to be active, right? You have to be an active member to continue to maintain um, an annual membership in that way. And COVID, you're right, was it took a very hard hit on many people's businesses, and we were very aware of that. Um, it took a hit, you know, on everyone at the same time, and also the the inflation that came from all of this has been difficult for people. And so we knew that people were going to be making the decision of whether or not to renew their membership. Um, and so I think it was in twenty. Was it 2021? Yeah, that I believe we did the two installment option for membership um, to help people offset some of the costs and pay it in two installments, pay the membership uh, fee in two installments. So that helped with some people's um, renewals, for example. Uh, but, you know, it's, th that was like a short term uh, solution to try to help people. And then we were thinking about what can we do for people long term? What do people need right now? Well, obviously, COVID had a big effect on people in many ways, but one of those was loss of work. Uh, and so our professional development committee has really stepped up our offerings as far as, um, you know, giving space for content that people are really looking at right now, that what's hot in the industry right now, things like audio visual, uh, things like video game localization, um, any kind of streaming has been a big thing, you know, and, and healthcare and, and so on. So they're really looking at offering uh, programs and content that people want to be learning about right now and that they know will help them in their business. The membership committee has also been looking at different things that we can do for members um, as far as benefits go. And we started some member orientation sessions, which I'm sure a lot of people have already heard about, um, just to, to go over like, what are the benefits of being an ATA member and are you taking advantage of these benefits? And it was really interesting what we saw from that was that we thought that it was just going to be new members um, taking advantage of these orientation sessions. And turns out that we've had a lot of long-term members, long-standing members, attend these orientations. And some of them have said, well, I didn't even realize we had that. And so it's sort of a balance between better communication with members about what our benefits are and also involving our members more in, um, in, in everything we do. And uh, the last thing I think that I th has been a big um, benefit of being an ATA member in the past couple of years has been our advocacy program. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that. So I don't want to get too far into it, but that has really taken off as well. 
Yeah, you just uh, teed me up for my next question because I <laughs> wanted to, and you and you basically teed us up for the next uh, several topics um, with a bit okay. of an overview because I did want to talk about what what some of the other uh, what are some of the committees are doing and and some of these efforts that are happening um, mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, you know. Um, increase awareness for for ATA and to uh, you know hopefully win new members and one of those things is advocacy you just mentioned it and um, ATA is doing a lot to raise awareness for you know our professions the translation and interpreting professions and you know acting a lot on behalf of professional and translators and interpreters so maybe you could take a, a, f a couple of minutes to give us an update on what the advocacy committee some of the activities the advocacy committee has done this year yeah, definitely. Well, they've had quite a year. This group has been very active and very on top of things. And if you know anything about advocacy, you know that it is a world that moves very quickly. Um, and sometimes on certain issues that last for quite a long time in, in the area of politics. So um, this year we've you know been under the leadership of Ben Carl in the Advocacy Committee. Uh, he chairs the committee and he has helped us as a group to respond to multiple calls for actions and step up in ways that I think make all of us proud to be ATA members, even if the legislation that is specific to a certain area doesn't affect all of our members, it does in some way affect everyone. Because one of the, the big problems in a way with um, the issues that we are advocating uh, on behalf of translators and interpreters for is that when certain changes happen in legislatures in certain areas of the country, there is sort of a domino effect where they then happen in another area of the country and then they happen in another state and then they happen in another state or city. And so this committee is helping to keep up with the different um, things happening, you know, that affect translators and interpreters all over the country, which is a huge task. And they are responding quickly to calls for action. Um, they, this year alone, the committee has drafted several letters to various organizations, some of which are the City of Santa Maria, right here in California, um, the Oregon Health Authority, the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, and there have been several others. Um, right now alone, they're working on a couple of things that are um, to send in comments during a comment period uh, related to potential um, you know, legislation. So. These are the things that our committee is doing on behalf of our members, directly on behalf of our members, but also for the professions. And so at the conference this year, they had a session about um, what we've done this year, as well as what members can do on their own to advocate for the professions. And I think Ben said it uh, very well at the conference, and he said, everybody is an advocate for our profession, whether you realize it or not. And so there are ways to be an advocate without, you know, taking away from the work that you do on a daily basis. And so I think there's place here for everybody to step up, but certainly the advocacy committee has done a lot this year and they're just going to continue to do more. Very well said uh, by Ben, definitely. Mm -hmm. You you brought it up a second ago or a minute ago, um, but I'd like to turn now to the membership committee and, um, and some of the things that they've been working on. Can mm -hmm. you, uh, um, Give us uh, an update on what the membership committee has been doing this year. Yeah, so the membership committee has been very active and it's an interesting committee because the membership committee is one that really collaborates with a lot of other committees depending on what they're working on. Uh, because everything that affects our members is part of membership, right? And so uh, Megan Conkle has been leading the membership committee over the past uh, couple of years or so after I was the chair, she became the chair. And she's been working on a lot of different things like the member orientation sessions that have really taken off. They're super, they're very well attended. Um, they are also working on a new membership survey. If you remember that we do a survey every few years of our membership. Uh, and this year the board asked the committee to sort of take a look at that membership survey again and add some questions in there to see really who our members are and get to know them better. So when you take this survey, which will be out probably within the next month, I think, um, make sure that you take the survey, please. And also make sure that you fill in um, the sections related to like who you are, how you identify, because we want to know how diverse our membership is. We want to know where our members are coming from, what is important to them. Do they feel represented in ATA? 
And that's something that's been very important to me as president of ATA, and it's very important to our board um, to make sure that our members feel represented. And anybody who doesn't, you know, what can we do to better represent them? So that is a very important section of that survey, but you'll also see questions related to member benefits and what would you like to see and what do you like about ATA and what would you like to see change and things like that. Um, and so Megan also shared a little bit about what they've been working on, but um, a couple of other items are the um, ebook for translators that we, we put out, I think it was now probably a couple of years ago. That ebook has just been useful for so many people um, who are looking to become translators and that can be found on our website. Uh, and they're working on an interpreter version of that. So hopefully that'll be out soon as well. Excellent, thank you very much for that update. Let's turn now to the Professional Development Committee. Now this committee um, is, you know, all about helping our members uh, with continuing education. And I understand this committee, speaking of busy, has been quite busy in recent years as well. Very, so uh, let yeah. us know uh, uh, what they've been up to. Yeah, so I think that this committee really hit its stride during the pandemic. Um, you know, it was important at the time for us to be able to step up for our members when we knew we couldn't meet in person, especially. Uh, and so we really ramped up the online offerings and this committee took um, that and, and just, like I said, they ran with it. Uh, so at the time it was being chaired by Veronica Demichelis, who after she became um, president elect, she realized, wow, there's a lot here going on. I really should probably pass this on. And, and as she should, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot to do both jobs of president elect and a professional development committee chair. And so after Veronica, um, the chair who is now in place is Nora Diaz. And Nora has been wonderful to continue the work that, that um, the committee had started over you know, the past two to three years. And they're really dedicated to bringing ATA members the highest level of continuing education opportunities that we can. Um, and they're, they're offering a variety of subject specific and language specific topics for webinars, workshops, um, and even the professional development podcast series on specialization, I think was, that was a collaboration with them, wasn't it? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so they're really focusing on the content that members want to see, that they want to improve their businesses, that they want to make sure that they have uh, opportunities that help them to grow and help them to uh, not only grow professionally, but grow their business. Um, and so we're, we're looking at that. They've got quite a setup for the next few months, um, a schedule of, of programs and events. And also we're looking at potentially offering a virtual conference in the spring. So if that happens, that will be um, fully virtual, not hybrid. And uh, that's how I think the future is going to be for a lot of our events is that we're really going to try to focus our efforts on the virtual events being fully virtual so we can really focus on attendees who are, you know, wanting the virtual um, content uh, or content delivered virtually and also our in-person events are, uh, you know, obviously our big one is the conference, um, annual conference being fully in person and really focusing on what that experience is for people who attend in person. Right on. Now, moving on to a topic that I think uh, both our old and new members who are listening will be quite interested in, and that is the mm -hmm. certification exam. And um, I think it's safe to say that the exam entered a new era recently. Um, so can, <laughs> yeah. can you tell us can you tell us about that? Yeah, they really did. I mean, it's been a long time coming, but it's been such a large project, right, for um, this program to be able to make this big leap. And I think that the work that was started um, even before, but especially during Michelle Hansen's tenure as chair of uh, the certification committee was, you know, paramount for this to, to, to work. And so Michelle Hansen is... Um, she passed away a few, a few weeks after our conference last year in 2021, and she at the time was the chair of the certification committee, but she had worked for several years on the committee, uh, as well as a, as deputy chair uh, when David Stevenson was the chair at the time for many, many years as well. And they worked very closely together. So this is not something that just happened overnight. It had been, they had been laying the foundation for this um, change to be, um, which the change is, by the way, I don't even think I've said it yet, uh, to, to be able to offer the exam online. 
right? And so uh, they did get it to the point where it could be offered online. And so they went through quite a process of figuring out how that would work, vetting different vendors for um, offering the, the exam online to members. And, and then the next step was going to be to um, not only be able to take it online, but to be able to take it on demand, which now that you can do. Uh, that was a huge uh, accomplishment by this committee, and I was so thankful when David Stevenson um, graciously stepped up to chair this committee again after Michelle Hansen passed away so suddenly, and he really just picked up that ball and took it, and, and you know, they have um, not only put the exam online, but the fact that it's on demand, you can literally take it whenever you want, is like such a change. I don't know if you remember when you took your exam, Matt, but for all of us who had to take it in person, you know, you either had to have it in, in a location that was near you or you had to travel to take it. Um, and that was a big expense as well on top of, the, you know, studying for the exam and the expense of taking the exam. And now that you can do it online in your basically your own home office where you tend to work every day, I think we couldn't have asked for anything better. And it's now available uh, to more members anywhere in the world. And that has we've seen the shift since this took place over the past year or so. Um, I guess probably now a couple of years. Time is a bit of a blur still. <laughs> um, but I think we've seen quite a shift to where we are offering very few in-person exams anymore because people can take it online. And there are some still in, in-person sittings, but for example, at this past year's conference this year, um, we saw fewer people taking the exam in person than we've seen in many, many years. So I think that says something about the fact that they created this option for people to now take it online and take it on demand. That was probably something that many people have wanted. I mean, I would have loved to take my exam that way. <laughs> I don't know about you, um, but it's it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, so. Yeah, I would have been on board right away. In fact, uh, I took it in mm -hmm. person the first time very early in my career, very unprepared and failed miserably. Did you take it by hand? Yes. Did you handwrite it? Hand. Oh. <laughs> hand wrote it. Yes. Handwritten. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to travel. Wow. It was an exam sitting right there in Boulder, uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. But I did show up with a okay. suitcase full of dictionaries and yes, mm -hmm. had to write it by hand. And um, I decided I wasn't going to take it again in, uh, until it was digital because by that time they were yeah. working on the digital exam. And so mm -hmm. I did, I, I took it on site at, at the AT conference in Washington, um, but mm -hmm. when it was digital and I could work on my computer and uh, that, that was a big step and I was waiting for that step. And now this step is just, is just the ultimate. So hats awesome. off to, yeah. hats off to the, uh, to, to the committee, to, 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 uh, you know, the late Michelle and she, uh, she did so much and to Steven, it's yes. uh, um, really, um, I mean, sorry, David. Um, it's just, uh, it's, I think it's a phenomenal, uh, a step for, for the program. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see, see it uh, be a real success. So I agree. Um, moving on here to another committee and that's the, the ethics committee. I understand they're working on an update to the ATA's ethics policy. Yeah. So, um, this was something that started under the previous chair, Jill Summer, um, the Ethics Committee has been working on revising the Code of Ethics, and so uh, they finished that this year under uh, Robin Bonthrone as the chair, uh, the current chair of the committee, and the approved the board approved the revised code, and so that's going to take effect starting January first, two thousand twenty-three, um, and the updated name is uh, is slightly different. It's the Code of Ethics and Professional Responsibility. Um, and so when you renew your membership, you're going to see that on the form that you um, agree to abide by our code of ethics. And uh, you'll see a link to the new, the revised code. And um, they've also been working on the commentary that accompanies the code so that people understand, like, what does this mean for me? And what does this mean um, as, a, as a member of ATA? And so, yes, they've been really revamping quite a bit um, in the ethics committee. And I think it's just going to make everything uh, more understandable for many members who who probably have questions about you know the code and such so they've they've done quite a bit of work my hat is off to them because it is a lot of work to try to revise things like this um, that are such a big deal for for members of a professional association and so yeah you'll see that very soon right on we'll be looking forward to that all right well Madalena we're 
slowly coming to the end of today's podcast, but I don't think we can end uh, this podcast today without talking about the departure of longtime executive de- director, Walter Bakak, who we all know as Mooch. Yeah, I know. Definitely. It, Mooch is a, an icon for, in our association. He has been with us for 28 years, and which is a very, very long time um, in any position, but especially in the, in the association world. And yeah, this year he decided he wanted to wrap up his time with us at ATA. And, you know, for a lot of us who've been members for a long time, he's the only executive director we've ever known. So uh, he's definitely been, um, you know, a strong uh, part of ATA. He has the a lot of the institutional memory of our association over the years, especially for the board. And we're just going to miss him very much. So we celebrated him at the annual conference this year, and we awarded him uh, with honorary membership, as well as you know, um, sort of a send off that we did um, during the annual meeting of all members. So that was pretty special. Yeah, it was a great tribute. I, for one, am one of those members who um, do not know. I uh, have never. I you know I joined in twenty in two thousand. So um, Mooch mm-hmm. was was already was already the executive director and had long been the executive director at that time. Yeah. So yes, right. he's going to, he's going to be missed, but uh, many of us at, in Los Angeles had the opportunity to meet our new executive director, Kelly Baxter, uh, because she was there and she is now already mm-hmm. on the job. I, I understand her first day was officially was literally the day after the conference uh, or the yeah. first mo- for the first Monday after the conference. So um can you tell us a little bit about Kelly? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was so happy that she was able to make it to the conference with us this year. Um, she is, you know, we we ha- we went through such a process because this is such an important step for the association to hire a new executive director. And so between April and, and really September, we went through the process of hiring this new person. And so um, I was joined by the rest of ATA's executive committee. Uh, and as well as past president Corinne McKay, um, Mooch, our current executive director at the time, and ATA's assistant executive director of membership and communications, Mary David. And uh, we led the search for our next uh, director, and we had over 40 applicants for the position. So we met many, many times over those, uh, what is it, five or six months to create the job ad, review applications, conduct interviews, and we, we had Kelly selected as our top candidate. She stood out to us from the beginning, uh, very early on, and she went through the different rounds of interviews, and it just became very, very clear that she was the one who was going to lead the association in our next you know, chapter, if you will. And uh, Kelly comes to us with a wide range of experience in the association world. She's been an executive director for many, many years. She has a background in data and IT. She knows event planning and management, and she just has a, a, a breadth of knowledge about different things that we um, we needed. And so we were so happy when she agreed um, uh, to our proposal to hire her. And she attended the conference this year. She did tell me she was very impressed by our annual conference and the staff. So I was so happy to hear that from her. Um, And you'll probably be seeing a lot more of her. I'm sure that she has her first column coming out as executive director here at the end of the year. So watch for that in the Chronicle too. Right on. Um, Thank you very much for that. Yes, it was a pleasure meeting, uh, meeting Kelly. And uh, I personally heard her make make that comment about about the, our conference. So um, mm-hmm. looking forward to working with her in, in the future. Me too. Well, Madalena, that pretty much yeah, that pretty much wraps it up for me. Uh, do you have any final words for our listeners? Yeah, I would just say, you know, continue to be active in ATA. We have so much going on that we offer our members. And if you want to get involved and volunteer for something, uh, let us know what that is and, and where you might like to um you know, collaborate with colleagues. There are so many different areas and so many different divisions and committees and things like that. And we really are um, wanting to bring more and more members into the fold of the different programs that we have. Um, And one last thing, obviously, we have membership renewal coming up here at the end of the year, the beginning of January. So watch for those renewals. We're not sending out paper anymore. So watch your inbox. You're going to have your renewal form there um, and link to that uh, in your inbox. So please renew your membership and let us know, you know, what else we can do for you as members. We are always open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. And we're looking forward to 2023. Well, that's a perfect way to end this podcast. Thank you so very much for joining me today, Madalena. Thanks, Matt. It's great to be here. All right. That's a wrap. 
I'd like to thank everyone who helped produce the show today. Derek Platts mixed and edited the audio, and Mary David and Rashawn Pacquarell at ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. If you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's someone out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about the podcast. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. Joining ATA literally launched my freelance career, and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all-time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make the difference. And ATA isn't just for translators and interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can join. We have teachers and professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. If you'd like to know more, go to ATA's website, atanet.org. You can also check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.